This is your host, Terry Welbrock, and just wanted to take a moment to wish Merry Christmas to those of you who celebrate Christmas and um, hoping your 2022 is filled with many blessings and joy. Um, I think this episode is going out on Christmas Eve, so yeah. Um, again, hope you're able to celebrate and uh, just have peace in your life um, during this holiday season. For those of you who do not celebrate, um, I wish you a wonderful weekend and a wonderful new year as well. Uh, Hoping it brings resolution for all of us. Um, And thank you for your continued prayers and support as I I'm still battling the health issues from mycotoxin poisoning uh, from mold exposure and just got the mold report back and I have ochratoxin A from aspergillus and um, oh, I'm trying to think what the other one, I, I'm drawing a blank on the second one, but in my system. So working on detoxing and uh, I'll probably write some blogs and maybe do a podcast about it and uh Yeah, after all is said and done, I may write a book about the whole thing because, wow, is it a story. Crazy, crazy. We we just came across a 56-page police report um, regarding this incident that led to the mold exposure. So, all right. Well, again, I wish you a joyous, joyous holiday season, and this was a great interview, so enjoy the show. Welcome, everybody, to the Healing Place podcast. I'm your host, Terry Welbrock, and very excited to have with me today Cheryl I love, and I love that last name. It's so amazing. So Cheryl is author, speaker, coach, podcaster, blogger, uh, so much more. And so I'm just really thrilled to have her here to talk about um, her healing journey and what she's done with it to, to guide others. So welcome, Cheryl. Well, thank you so much for having me, Terry. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. We're another another find through Pod Match, which is awesome. And um, yeah, I'm so just so excited that we we found each other. And I've been on your show now. You're be going to be on mine. And um, again, I'm just I'm I'm thrilled to have you and the audience um, connect, and for the audience to hear your story because it certainly is inspirational. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. And once again, thank you so much for being on the show um, or for letting me be on the show and for being on mine too as well. That was just wonderful to have you. And just to give your audience a little bit of insight, we really had kind of like a girl crush going on right away is as soon as we met, it was like almost we were soul sisters or something. So it was a great connection. And I was just so happy to be um, preparing for this show. And again, thanks for having me on. Absolutely. I can start by telling you a little bit about myself that, um, you know, 30 years ago, if you would have told me that I'd be an award-winning author, writing a book on fitness over 50, and then having my own podcast and being on your show, I first I would have laughed. And then I would have burst into tears. And then I would have seriously questioned your sanity because I was the last person in the world anybody would ever expect to be in that position where I would be considered an expert in the art of movement and helping people through their healing journey by teaching them the art and the healing power of movement. And what happened with me, I actually, um, in my mid thirties, I was dancing a lot. I was never a professional ballet dancer, but I did take a lot of dance classes. And what started out as like a vague tightness and discomfort in my low back, it was like, but that caught my attention. I tried to stretch it out and, you know, try to ignore it because you think, well, you ignore it, it'll go away. And eventually it got to the point where it was getting tighter and tighter. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know what's going on. So I tried to treat it myself with hot packs and stretching. And that worked about as well as ignoring it. And it actually ended up spiraling out of control. So in just a few short months, I went from being a very healthy, vibrant, active, young woman to being a chronic pain patient. And when I say chronic pain patient, I mean incapacitating, debilitating 
pain that went from my low back all the way down across both hips into one leg and all the way down to my big toe, which I didn't know at that point what that was sciatica. So it was a sciatic nerve um, injury. And of course, I was a medical person at the time. I was not a physical therapist. I was a respiratory therapist. So I was very deeply ingrained in the Western medical model. So of course I went to the doctors and, you know, they were vague diagnoses, nothing really that they could pinpoint, but my, it gave me medications, anti-inflammatories, uh, muscle relaxers, and what was the, oh yeah, pain pills. <laughs> I forgot about that one. And then of course sent me to physical therapy and they gave me all kinds of stretches and exercises that I needed to do. Sent me to massage therapists. I was doing everything I was told to do. And instead of getting better, I was getting worse. And I just kept spiraling down this horrible cycle of chronic pain uh, until I couldn't work. I mean, I had to really drastically cut down on my work hours. And I mean, I was living in chronic pain instead of going to my Pilates classes and my ballet classes, I was going to the doctors and to the therapists and hoping and praying for any kind of relief. And it wasn't until one of my doctors at an appointment said to me, you know, you're never going to be able to do your laundry and your grocery shopping all in the same day because the arthritis in your spine is so severe, you will end up being bedridden. And I just looked at her and I mean, it was almost like she, you know, it was a slap in the face. And I says, um, you don't understand. I'm planning on going back to ballet class. And she looked at me and she laughed at me and said, you don't understand. This is your new normal. You will never have the life you had before. You will never have the life you wanted to have. This is your new normal. You are a chronic pain patient, but don't worry about it. We will take care of you. And I mean, I was just, I, I couldn't even speak. I was speechless. And then she said, oh, and forget about physical therapy school. She knew that was a goal of mine. I was you know, considering trying to get into PT school and I was already taking classes. And she said, you're just too broken. You cannot do the work. And even if you could, you're just too old. Oh my gosh, how disheartening. I know. And I was only 36 years old. So there I am, 36 years old. I've been in chronic pain at this point for two and a half years, constantly. The medical profession that I was a part of, not only did they let me down, I think they were actually, not intentionally, but making me worse and actually, you know, uh, continuing that cycle of pain and spasm, making it worse and worse and worse. And then this woman actually, you know, she just takes away my hope. She shatters mm -hmm. my dreams. She destroys my spirit and leaves me with nothing. And I'm like, what am I supposed to do with this? So I went home and I hit rock bottom. I'll be honest. But a few days later, I got an epiphany. And I don't know if I'm born with a natural warrior spirit, a, a fighting spirit, I don't know. Um, but I got an epiphany and it was like, you know what? You're gonna have to figure this out on your own because they're not helping you. So I fired all of my doctors. I fired all my therapists, much to their chagrin because they said I needed them. I was gonna get hurt if I didn't have them taking care of me. Well, at that point that ship had already sailed. So it's like, I, I think this is a much better decision. I haven't tried this yet. Right. And I taught myself how to move. None of us remember when we were babies or infants, but how did we learn how to move? How did your children learn how to move? By exploring movement, exploring their environment, you know, just playing. Nobody gave us baby barbells and said, okay, now do these, <laughs> these bicep curls, then put one hand here, one hand here, move your hip this way, and then you'll roll over. We figured it out for ourselves. So I already knew enough movement. I had been studying Pilates at that point, just for my own benefit for about 13 years. So I knew enough Pilates. I knew the mat work pretty well. I knew enough movement through my ballet training, even though I just started dancing when I was 20, which is very old, but to begin training in ballet. So I knew movement and it was time for me to know my body and really embrace that mind body connection. So again, I fired everybody. I stopped taking the medication. I stopped doing the silly um, stretches and exercises that the PTs gave me because they weren't helping. So, you know, isn't that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over right. and over and over again and expecting a different result. 
So the only thing, other thing that I did do that I added was acupuncture, which was a little uncomfortable for me as a Western medicine trained individual who had really embraced the medical model to be walking into an acupuncture. You know, I was like, oh my gosh, I hope nobody sees me, you know, right. because this is really embarrassing. But that, so that was the only thing I, I added. And the combination of the acupuncture with what I was doing, teaching myself how to move and really paying attention to my body rather than, okay, these are the exercises that I was told to do. And this is the right way to do them. I have to do them this way. If I don't do this them this way, then I'm not going to get any better. I just threw that out the window and it's like, let's explore. So it took a while and in about, took a few months, maybe about three to four months, I was able just to walk back into ballet class. I didn't do much. I didn't do much. And everybody was, you know, I said, okay, just ignore me. I'm going to be here in the corner. You just let me do my thing. And when I've had enough, I'll leave. And after about 20 minutes, I went walking out of class and everybody's looking at me like, oh, I'm so sorry. And the, the looks of pity were just pathetic. And it's like, I didn't feel pathetic. I felt victorious because I was able to do 20 minutes of just the basic warm up that I couldn't even get out of bed several months earlier, my husband had to help me. So that was part of the healing journey. And I just went with that. And I kept, um, you know, practicing and playing and exploring. And guess what, I wasn't too old to become a physical therapist, because I did get out of pain, I was very stiff and clumsy and had gained a lot of weight, but I was no longer a chronic pain patient. And right after that happened, I did get accepted into um, the master's program for physical therapy at Colorado University. And I graduated with my master's degree three months shy of my 40th birthday. So I guess that doctor was wrong. I wasn't too old. Yes. Oh, my gosh. I'm telling you, I mean, you just inspired me. And I'm just going to steer to me for just one second because I've been battling this little histamine issue for the past few weeks, the podcast, I had to put it on hold and so forth. Well, yesterday, I, my, my lymph nodes started swelling in my throat and under my ears. And I was like, oh my gosh. And so I looked it up and sure enough, it is a symptom, a hard and painful swollen lymph nodes are part of HITS, which is histamine intolerance syndrome. Um, and I said, I, I spiraled very quickly and I, there was a lot of tears. I was crying and I was in so much pain and I had a rice bag on my neck and I was like, I'm taking all my supplements and I'm seeing my nutritionist and I'm doing, you know, what I'm supposed to be doing. And I, I have steered away from traditional and more towards the holistic side. And so mm -hmm. I was just like, Oh my gosh. And I just feel so overwhelmed. And so you just saying those words about, you know, I have a warrior spirit. Well, I've always said that about myself. I've always called myself a trauma warrior. Mm -hmm. So this is just another one of those moments. So thank you for that. Because as you said it, I felt my heart like this, this thing that's inside of us, our soul, our heart, our light, whatever it is, I felt it expand. So what a gift you just gave me. And I just want to say thank you. <laughs> oh, well, you're welcome. And I have to tell you, we all need those reminders sometimes because I get in that same space where it's like, oh, no, this hurts or that hurts or what's going wrong. And, what's, and it's like, stop it. This is not a problem. This is an opportunity to learn. And, you know, especially with someone like you, I, I don't know how long, because you moved to a new environment, yes, didn't you? So I yes. don't know how long you've lived there. So your immune system is saying, hey, what's this stuff that I'm dealing with? This is different, you know, and then I'm going to kick into high gear to try and push it out. So it could be just your immune system is starting to... Um, you know, just adapt and adjust to a new environment, new, new pollutants or new um, allergens. But I always recommend people go to the doctor to clear out the bad stuff. Or, you know, it's like, okay, this is what's going on. This is, I think this is what's happening, but I want you to make sure that there's nothing else going on that's more serious than I need to worry about. Yes. And I agree. And you're the second yeah. person that's told me that about moving uh, just in the past two weeks. And I, 
I have heard that living in South Carolina, at least in this low country area, that there's it's higher mold, it's oh, yeah. higher, there's just more allergens than from where I came from in Ohio. And I've never had allergies before, but I do have an appointment with an allergist and I'm going to have the skin test because I wanted, I, I truly want to know, are there other underlying factors going on here that's triggering right. all of it? Right. And then I can adjust. So I certainly, I love your, I love your philosophy of, looking at um, moments in life that that can be a struggle and saying, what can I learn from this? And exactly. um, yeah, for sure. Because, you know, everything, no matter the good, you know, the bad, the ugly, we all have our trials and tribulations and our tough times in life. And if you can turn it around and say, okay, I know I can get through this and I know I can learn something. Yeah. And then, you know, you almost approach it. I like to approach it as I'm like my own personal little private detective, you know, so I, I, it gives me another opportunity to learn what's going on inside my body. And of course, um, you know, we're maturing and I don't call it aging because we start getting older ever, you know, since the moment that we're born. So it's just another phase of life and things do change. We're dynamic um, organisms, you know, our needs change as we go through life. And I'm not trying to say that we have to get rid of other things. We could even take on new things that really help us stay healthy, vibrant. The real key is to keep an open mind and never to stop looking because there's so many things out there, so many modalities, so many alternative health methods, um, you know, it's, you can always find an answer for yourself. We're all different and we all need, you know, different solutions. Oh, I love it. And I love that philosophy. And I, I say amen and hallelujah, because <laughs> I just recently I'd interviewed someone and she does healing, healing sounds. And she mm. did a did a little 31 day program on her YouTube. And I thought, Oh, I'm going to try that out. Well, it helped like I just felt more centered. And it was beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. It's even the small things that you don't think of are going to make a difference. They really do. Yeah. So. Beautiful. Awesome. So, All right. After, so continue your story. <laughs> All righty. So after I graduated from physical therapy school, well, this here's a deep, dark secret. Okay. Shh, don't tell anybody. Um, I really, really did not enjoy being a physical therapist in traditional physical therapy settings. It was not what I thought it was going to be. I had just busted my tail to get into the program and then to, you know, get through the two years. It was a grueling program. And the profession at that time, it was pretty much, um, it was 1996 when I graduated. And there was like a glut of PTs. Um, there were a lot of Medicare changes. You know, the profession was going through a rough time and there were very few jobs available. And the jobs that were available were very unpleasant. And um, they were ones that the senior you know, and seasoned therapists wouldn't take. So the new grads got the really grunt work and it was miserable. And it was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did this to myself. And I even had to go back and do some more respiratory therapy, which was actually kind of fun um, and got paid more because I had a, a master's degree now, but it's like, but my master's is in something else, whatever. Right. So it got me through, you know, it's like, it makes no sense. So for two and a half years, I struggled through that environment. And it was finally, I was at another interminable meeting and they're talking about more layoffs. And it was like, hey, wait a minute, Pilates, is making a huge, you know, is starting to really become mainstream. When I started taking uh, Pilates, there were only two studios in Denver and there were like, you know, just one or two in LA and one or two in New York. And Pilates was something that people didn't really know about. And then all of a sudden it was starting to gain traction. And I thought, you know what? There are people out there that don't have the kind of background that I do and they're teaching Pilates, imagine what I could do with it. I had already gone through um, two professional training programs. I was now a physical therapist. I was a dancer, I understood movement and I was a recovering chronic pain patient. So I knew how to help people help themselves. So my focus, I opened up my own office, called it I Love Integrated Arts. And I had that running for 18 years and specialized in Pilates-based rehabilitation and conditioning. And then I added something else called Feldenkrais, which is a very sophisticated form of neuromuscular re-education that really targets the nervous system and the skeletal system. 
and it integrates the mind body connection in such a beautiful way. So I added that to my skill set, even though it was a four year long training program. And it was like, once I tried Feldenkrais, I had to do it. I mean, I had to get that certification because it made such a difference for me in my life and the next part of my healing journey um, that it was just so important to me that I had to become certified so I could share it with other people. Beautiful. Yeah, I, I had seen that word and I didn't know how to say it on the uh, on your website. And so yeah. yeah, very cool. And I, I was that person when I was doing I think Zumba or something. And I was like, what's this pilots? What's this? <laughs> I didn't even know how to say Pilates. <laughs> Well, here's the funny thing. The way I got into Pilates was, you know, oh my gosh, I think it was in 1983. And it was because my ballet master at the time had actually studied with Joseph Pilates when he was living in New York, when Mr. Boyette was in New York. And he had one of um, the students who was my age at the time, of course, back then we were a lot younger. And he kept saying to this guy, Mike, you need to open a Pilates studio. You need to do this. You need to do this. And, you know, Mike was a little you know, thick headed and he wouldn't do it. And finally he says, okay, I'll find out what it's all about. And then he did open up his own little Pilates studio. And that's how I was introduced to it because Mr. Boyette, my ballet master said, every dancer should do Pilates. So, okay, well, I'll do Pilates. Um, but it's really interesting because nobody really knew about it. And then when I got into physical therapy school, I started telling everybody about it, my clinical instructors, my professors, my classmates. And so this was 1994. And I got the same reaction from everybody. Well, Pilates is nice for dancers, but you know, it's no good for anything else. And I'm like, really? And um, then I'm up years, wrong. <laughs> and I did. And a few years after I graduated, then um, the rehab community found out about Pilates. And then they decided that they should own it. And I mean, it was really just crazy, but uh, you know, and it, it's, it's just, it's insane. Wow. Very cool. Yep. Awesome. So, yeah, so I was, you know, I was doing great. I had just opened up my own practice and, you know, I was getting a lot of wonderful clients and, you know, some clients that were like me who had been brushed off by the medical community. You're never going to get better. And it was just going great. And I was able to get myself into much better shape and, you know, than I was before my injury because I had never had a chance to fully recover and get into the kind of shape that I had been prior to. And yeah, life was just going great guns. I was 44. I was, you know, on my own business and, you know, I was looking pretty good and I was looking toward the future. And then I got the rug pulled out from underneath me again. And this time it was bad. So yeah, yeah. I walked into a doctor's office for a routine checkup as a healthy, vibrant 44 year old woman. And I walked out a statistic. And of course, there's a whole lot more to the story. Um, and I really struggled with the PTSD for a long time, as well as more chronic pain in different ways from the incident and the injuries that I sustained from the incident. And all of this is going to be included in an upcoming book that should be coming out in, oh, I don't know, maybe the fall or the, the definitely before the, the 2022. Um, so basically, I struggled for a long time because one thing that happens when women are assaulted, I understand now why they don't come forward and tell people about it or to try and get help because that's what I did. I tried to get help. I tried to report it. I even, you know, went to the people who were closest to me, you know, my husband, my very best friend, everybody just shut me down. And they said, that can't possibly happen. My husband, God bless him, did not say that. He said, this is girl stuff. You go talk to your girlfriends and everybody sat me down. This cannot happen. You know, you're making it up. You know, even my colleagues at, at work, I mean, it was crazy because I was doing some work for a clinic at the time as well. And, you know, finally, I just like, okay, you just shut up. You don't say anything. Right. You just stuff it. And of course, as you know, <laughs> my trauma warrior, that you can only stuff it for so long before it comes blah, flying out at you and it's not pretty. So along this time, it was just four months after that incident, I found a new acupuncturist. 
And he came highly recommended by one of my clients. And for some reason I listened to her cause I knew how picky she was. And I went to this guy, very nice man. who's about six years older than me. And when he put needles in my legs for the first time that I went to him, he got a very far away look on his face. And he said, you know, with your legs and my coaching, I could teach you how to kill with these things. And I'm literally pinned to the table. I couldn't <laughs> move. And I'm thinking, holy cow, who thinks like this? Who alone says that? Says it out loud to another human being. This is right. just insane. So I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I, I again, I couldn't grab my purse and run because I was, had needles all over me. And so it's like, well, thanks for thinking of me, but I'm just not interested in that. Well, it took him three years. Actually, it was a year before he found out what had happened to me. And that was because, you know, again, it came flying out of me and I finally confided in him and he was using acupuncture to actually help, you know, treat with some of the symptoms I was having. And then his campaign to get me on the mat to train with him because he had a dojo right next to his clinic. It was like this little duplex and his campaign to get me on the mat and train with him went into high gear. And he kept saying, Cheryl, it can help you so much. There's an incredible healing power in martial arts and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, your confidence and it'll help you heal. And I'm looking at him going, I hardly think that hanging out with a bunch of sweaty men is really going to help me feel any better right about now. So thanks anyway, but no. So for three years, three years, I kept saying, no, I'm not going to do it. I know I, I just until finally he wore me down and I said, OK, I'll take a few classes just to prove to you how much I'm going to hate it. <laughs> and 10 years later, I became his first female black belt. <laughs> That's so amazing. Yes. So I began my training at the tender young age of 47, you know, this middle-aged ballet, you know, dancer come running in into this dojo full of men. Mark, my teacher assured me that there are plenty of women who trained with him, but it's really interesting because I never saw any of the women going in and out when I was at his clinic waiting for him to finish his noon class. And he goes, oh, they take evening classes. Well, you know, a lot of times I, uh, some of these mythical women would show up, but most of the time they didn't. So there I was just this little middle-aged princess surrounded by all these men going, I am so out of my comfort zone. I, you know, this is so weird. And I was terrified. But I found something fascinating. I was having fun. Even my first class, I mean, it was so, I have some really funny stories there in the book, uh, really funny things that happened because I, you know, again, I was so out of my element, but even after that first class, there was something, I mean, I giggled all the way home and I hadn't giggled in a very long time, but there was something about it that just was so, I don't know, refreshing, so energizing, so stabilizing and so playful, which you don't really associate play with a martial art. I mean, you think of fighting, you think of combat, you think of sparring. Well, the art that I study, we actually do play a lot. We're ninjas where, you know, this is based on the art of the ninja and ninjas like to play. They like to, you know, have a good time. You know, we are have the, the spirit of a warrior is very compassionate. It's very loving. We have kind hearts. We don't want to fight. We just want to be able to go home and take care of ourselves, our families, our community. But if you cross the line, okay, now it's game on. So just, you know, I kept going to class and that's another key point. I think that I want to make for your listeners. I never intended to get a black belt. I never intended to get a yellow belt. I didn't even want the white belt, but it came with a <laughs> uniform. So I had to, you know, keep the pants on, but I didn't, I just kept going to class. I kept showing up. And I just kept thinking, I want to live to survive another day and another class. And that was where my focus was. And I would learn the techniques and I would pay really close attention, not because I was such a good student, because I was scared. These are guys and they're, you know, hitting and punching and kicking and throwing and pinning you down to the ground. But it was really fun. It was part of me that I don't know, always must have existed 
and had to come out and it came out in this way. So um, yeah, started training at 47, got my first black belt at 57 and rose up to Shodan, which is considered like second or third degree black belt or first degree black belt, depending on the art that you study. So yeah, that was just, it's been an amazing journey and it's been so much fun. And there were so many life lessons that I learned in my training that, you know, I, I'm going to share in another book. It's a follow-up book um, because I don't think there's a lot of women out there that want to spend 17 years in a smelly dojo with a bunch of sweaty men kicking and punching and hitting and pinning and throwing them like I did. But there were so many, so much value you can get out of the principles that I learned through that, that you can apply to every single aspect of your life. And basically that's what I've been able to do when things get rough and heaven knows life is full of hits and you learn how to either evade, get out of the way or deflect or turn them around when you study an art like this. And so it has helped me get through a lot of really other tough situations, but yeah. Awesome. Sammy's having a little nightmare behind me. Hold on one second. Oh, can you hear her going? Oh, oh, I oh, oh, do. Oh, oh. Sam, oh. are you okay? Okay, her tail's wagging. I, I woke I her up. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh no, she probably can hear that. So I have to tell you real quick. So I think I had told you in our conversation on your show that both of my sons did, um, yes. uh, it wasn't karate, but they, they did a martial arts program uh -huh. when they were younger. John got his black belt. Jake, Jake got up to brown belt. He just couldn't get his kicks up high enough to break those boards. But um, <laughs> what was crazy, and it, I just love it that you're talking about, it, it was mostly guys, but their instructor was a woman. And so, and she was, had her black belt and she was amazing. And so I loved Miss Brown. And well, my parents came to see the boys test for one of their, they were going to, going to test for their next belt level. And my mom sitting next to me and my dad and my mom says, oh my gosh, you used to babysit her. And I was like, what? Here I used to babysit the, the girl that was teaching, the, the woman, sorry, I didn't mean girl, the woman <laughs> that was teaching my kids all this time. And then I was like, so cute. Oh my gosh, I remember I was probably like 10 years old, you know, and she was five or six or whatever. So here she was teaching my kids. And I just thought that was so then I was just so blown away because I was in awe, in mm -hmm. awe of her because she would do demonstrations beforehand. And oh my, like she could just break anything in half. I think she did a brick once or something. And oh it was my just, goodness. It was so amazing. Like she was just amazing. So yeah. yeah. And did it make you proud? It was just almost like, you know, you look at somebody like that, that you knew when they were that little and right. like, look at them today and you know, yeah, I'm so proud. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> so funny. Awesome. So yeah, I, I mean, we could sit and talk for such a long time. Is there anything that you wanted to touch upon that, that we haven't had a chance to talk about yet? You know, I really just want to emphasize that don't let anybody put a label on you because that's what happened to me when I was that chronic pain patient. And I kept hearing that, you know, this, you're a chronic pain patient. You have to do this. You'll never be able to do this again. You have to be very careful. You're frail. If those same people could see me take down somebody, <laughs> you know, twice my size and half my age, so much for frail. So what happens is when we hear those messages from other people and even the messages that we tell ourselves, eventually we believe it and eventually we become it. So be very, very careful what you tell yourself about yourself. Be very positive. Do not denigrate yourself, not even in jest because your brain, your nervous system is constantly taking that in and processing that information. So be very kind to yourself, be loving, be gentle. And I'm telling this to remind myself too, because we all have that negative self-talk that just, you know, rawr, comes up every now and again. Um, and be careful of the labels. Don't let anybody put a label on you and do not let anybody tell you what you can and cannot do. Yes. Because you can I, do anything that oh, you want to. I love that message. As you were saying it, I was saying to myself, I am a warrior. I'm not even, I even like the idea that you say warrior and not trauma warrior because then it's connecting the trauma to it and just say I'm a warrior. Right. Exactly. I mean, you know, we're all warriors. We all have that warrior spirit deep inside of us. Um, sometimes we just need, you know, to discover it, find out how we're going to bring it forth. But 
that warrior is there to help us and, and help us recover from trauma, illness, betrayal, you know, anything that, that is any of those bumps in the road or what I call them the hits in life, because, you know, hits come in all shapes and, and, and forms. So having that warrior spirit right there and to understand that warrior doesn't mean fighting, warfare, conflict. Warrior spirit is something that is there to help you protect, protect yourself, <clears throat> protect your family, protect your community, protect others who can't really protect themselves. This is something I used to do once I started climbing up the ranks, probably, you know, like red belt to getting closer to brown, is that I would actually fight for women who couldn't fight for themselves. Do you know what I mean? There was yeah. a lady um, up in the mountain town. She and her husband owned a, you know, cabins that we would rent from all the time. And she was dealing with breast cancer and it was, you know, recurrent and stuff. And, um, you know, we went when she was having to go back to chemo again. So she's, oh yeah, and I'm chemo again and blah, 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 blah. And I told her, I says, you know, Teresa, when I go back home, I go back to the dojo, every punch, every kick, every strike is going to be for you, for you beating that cancer. Oh. And she's like, oh, I got chills. But oh, I, would do I that got goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a lot of people out there who can't fight for themselves. And I would just think of them as I was going, you know, like through the training and through the katas. Um, you know, and, and imagine them and sharing that warrior spirit with them, because I believe that that everybody has that much power in them, but it takes a lot sometimes to find it. And, you know, look what it took for me. Yeah. Well, I'm just such a fan of energy. And so you, you were just emitting that energy and I'm sure she she absorbed it and felt it. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. Oh my gosh. So how do, how do people find you, get in touch with you? Um, you can email me info at Cheryl, And remember there's no E on the end of I love everybody puts an E there because it's pretty much a habit. Sometimes even I still do it myself. Um, but you can also go to my website. It's Cheryl, I um, Just look up Cheryl, I love, and you'll find me. Wonderful. And excited about your book coming out. We'll have to do a Facebook oh live gosh. or something when it launches and we'll, we'll put you out there so everybody can follow the links. Can I tell the audience? The oh, title for it? sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've got, you can see for those of you on, on YouTube, the book over my shoulder, forever fit and flexible, feeling fabulous at 50 and beyond. That was my first book. Um, and it was published exactly four years ago. And so the title of this book is The Reluctant Ninja, <laughs> How a Middle-Aged Princess Became a Warrior Queen. <laughs> I can't wait to read it. Oh my gosh, well, thank that's you. awesome. It's, we're in the second round of developmental editing. So I am um, ex expecting to get it back from my editor maybe in another week or two. And uh, ooh, yeah, it's very, very exciting. Yeah, that is. Oh my gosh, I love it. And it's, well, it's so funny. Well, you know what it's like writing a book. Yeah. And yeah. And you go through the emotions. And I remember when I was really working on it and I was going like through my first day at the dojo and I'm sitting here in my basement by myself on my computer and I'm laughing and laughing. And it was just so much. I was having such a good time. And then as I was going on, it was like, wait a minute, that, that, that part wasn't so good. And it was like, oh gosh, you go through the emotional roller coaster. Oh Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I mean, I think that's what's mine's like 90% completed. And I've sat mm -hmm. on that other 10% for so long. And I mean, like years, <laughs> because it's that it's that, that stuff that I just, oh, I'm just avoiding going into. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you know, I have the most wonderful editor in the world. I love her. She's so sweet. Um, but she's like, you know, in getting her notes from the first round of editing. Well, what were you feeling? when this was happening and what was your internal sense or you know what were you what was going through you emotionally as you were experiencing this and I was like I don't do emotions okay I mean I don't I do joy and I do rage anything else is <laughs> off the table I can't talk about 
Oh my God. I love it. <laughs> well, I just adore you. I just think you're so amazing. Thank you Aww, again. Thank for, you. Yeah. For being here and, and shining your light of hope and the work you're doing in the world. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Terry. And thank you so much for being part of my circle of friends now. It's so very exciting. I was just through doing these po podcasts and meeting so many wonderful people and you are like way up there. And I really do believe that you are the happiest person that I know. Oh, thanks. Especially after that makes my heart happy. Like again, I have goosies because <laughs> my, my spiral yesterday where I was just like, oh, just being so pathetic. And, <laughs> but Ooh. you know, I allowed myself that gift of just let it out, get a good cry in Terry. <laughs> So I did a lovely interview with a lady about a week or so ago, and you know she had a, a very traumatic life, and you know is on the other side now and helping other women. And she said something. What was it? She because I says I don't I, I don't do emotions, and she says, Oh, you need to cry. Crying is so good. Crying is the faucet to your heart. Oh. And I wrote it down somewhere. So it's like, that yeah, is, okay. that's so sappy. It speaks to my sappy heart. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> exactly. Oh. But you know, sometimes you just really do need to have a really good, ugly cry, let it out. Yes. But you know, you know, I do mine in private. Yeah. Uh, the car is the greatest place, you know, go to the car. Yes. Take a drive. Yeah. I was crying. Yeah, I was crying yesterday. I didn't even put my sunglasses on because I was like, I don't want everybody to see me being like this. <laughs> That's so funny. Oh my gosh. Well, again, thank you. And um, yeah, it's been awesome. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much, Terry, and have a great rest of your day. And I hope Sammy's nightmares are gone. Yeah, she's back. She's back snoring. I can hear her snoring back there. Okay. All yeah. right. So everyone, thanks for joining us today on the Healing Place podcast. And remember, until next time, be gentle with yourself. Thanks. Bye-bye. Hey, everybody. Terry Welbrock again. Just wanted to thank you for listening to the episode today and remind you to visit my website as well as the Academy terrywellbrock.com for the courses but if you go to my website terrywellbrock.com you can sign up for my monthly hope for healing newsletter which is also jam-packed with information and strategies and blog pieces and guest blog pieces and links to shows um, and just a great space for uh, again healing and hope strategies Thanks for, again, being here and being a part of this healing space. I very much appreciate you. All right. Bye-bye.